Hi, welcome to our interview show in which we interview LGBTQ guests who are important contributors to our community. We want to acknowledge that All Things LGBTQ is produced at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which is unceded indigenous land. Enjoy the show. Hi, everybody. I'm here with Julie Enzer, the editor and publisher of Sinister Wisdom. Welcome. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. I would like to read your bio, if I may, in the beginning. Sure. Julie R. Enzer is a scholar and poet. Her scholarship is at the intersection of US history and literature with particular attention to 20th century US feminist and lesbian histories, literatures and cultures. By examining lesbian print culture with the tools of history and literary studies, she reconsiders histories of the women's liberation movement and gay liberation. Her book manuscript, which we're here to talk about, A Fine Bind, Lesbian Feminist Publishing from 1969 through 2009, tells stories of a dozen lesbian feminist publishers to consider the meaning of the theoretical and political formations of lesbian feminism, separatism, and cultural feminism. Heady stuff. Her research has appeared, or is forthcoming, in Southern Cultures, Journal of Lesbian Studies, American Periodicals, WSQ, Frontiers, and other journals. Enzer is the author of four collections of poetry, Avowed, Lilith Diamonds, Lilith Demons, Lilith Demons, Sisterhood, and Handmade Love. She's the editor of the Complete Works of Pat Parker and Milk and Honey, a Celebration of Jewish Lesbian Poetry. Milk and Honey was a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award in Lesbian Poetry. She is the editor of Sinister Wisdom, as I said, a multicultural lesbian literary art journal and a regular book reviewer and now contributing editor for the Lambda Book Report, well, Lambda Literary Review and Calix. Enzer has her MFA and PhD from the University of Maryland. Welcome again. Thank you. I have uh, some questions that I'd like to start with. Um, how did you become interested in the topic? Well, you know, um, from my early, from from being a young reader and really discovering lesbian novels, and um, one of the examples I often like to use is reading *Ruby Fruit Jungle* for the first time in 1987 or 1988. So it had been out for well over a decade at that point, and I um, encountered it in the little in the small mass market paperback by Bantam Books, right? Which is how a lot of people see it now, and. One day in the library at the University of Michigan where I went, I found the trade paperback book of Ruby Fruit Jungle that came out from Daughters. And it, and it, it just interested me so much, these sort of two editions and the different ways that I encountered them. You know, one as a course textbook in a women's studies class and then one is still in the library in this, you know, a very different size, a different format. Um, there was no photograph of Rita Mae Brown on the back. And of course, by the late 80s, Rita Mae Brown was also writing her um, cat mystery novels, right? And, and had had very high profile lesbian relationships and was a much, was both an author, but also a celebrity. And um, so, the difference between those two books really intrigued me. And I, um, a lot of, uh, I think my animating question going into doing PhD, my research for my PhD is like, how do these different books get in the world and what's the meaning and significance of them? 
Um, and, you know, in addition to that, in the late 80s, I was reading um, all, all of the Firebrand books that were just starting to come out. Um, I was discovering, um, I was again discovering the difference between um, the different editions of This Bridge Called My Back and all of these feminist classics. And I wanted to know how do women publish their own books and put them out there in the world? Um, and, and so that's really, like, that's really what brought me in to say, this is, this is interesting. I want to know about it. Um, and also, you know, as I, as I was discovering it and reading and, and, um, time was passing also, we were seeing, um, presses fold, newspapers fold and not publish anymore and, um, magazines. And so I was really, I'm interested in the, the life cycle of these, um, of these community communications devices and community organizations and how, how do they come into being, how do they flourish, and then how do they end? Although some are continuing. Exactly. Sinister Wisdom. Exactly. Sinister Wisdom's continuing. Ant Loop Books um, continues. It's one of the, the surviving presses that I really um, love. Um, Nyad continuing through Bella Books. Um, and the ways, and that's another thing, you know, of course, you know, from Sinister Wisdom, one of my interests is how do we transmit and how do we bring um, and share with other generations things that we find of value, practices that we feel like are important to community formations, and how do we, how do we share those, and how do we help um, organizations last and extend their life? How, why uh, the chronological demarcation? Why between 1969 and 2009? Well, 1969 is easy to answer because that's really when Women's Press Collective was kind of this nascent formation out there in the Bay Area. And I really start with that as a press. Um, I think 1969, 1970 is this time where, um, where feminism has more, has more of its footing where many women who are lesbians, it's kind of are, are inspired by everything that's happening with gay liberation. And so I think like that's a period where this whole idea of lesbian feminist as, as two words linked together with power becomes meaningful. And so that's kind of where I start out and move from. Now I have to confess 2009, um, I, I had hoped to finish this book manuscript in 2015. Um, it's still not quite done, though it's very close. Um, but so in 2013, when I thought that I was going to finish in 2015, 2009 seemed like a good period, a good time frame to end. Um, and um, you know, there's there's a satisfying aspect of it being 40 years. Um, I think, which is a, a part of the time frame. I want, I want to take, um, and and as I as I said, I'm interested in this intergenerational um, um, communication and and ways that we pass things down. So I wanted the time frame to be large enough to give a sense that um, this is and continues to be um, a viable, ongoing. Um, way of organizing and a way of doing work in the world. Um, I'm deeply inspired by Joan Pinkfoss's work at um, Ant Loop Press, by the work that happens at Bella Books, by the kind of continuing work that women do around publishing um, books and journals and getting them into the world. So that's, so that's partially why I want it to be an expansive history so that people don't um, say this is, this is a relic of the past because in fact, there's so much that continues to happen. And so many of us continue to find strength and meaning from that work that has happened in the past. Well, that leads into my next question. How has lesbian print culture evolved over time, would you say? Well, you know, it's so, um, it's so interesting. I have always um, marveled 
at the work women did in when they when they, you would actually physically do paste up of pages to send them to the printers right and and in all forms of print people did this both for books and for um newspapers and magazines they would like you would literally typeset something on a on an ibm selectrix or some kind of typewriter cut it out paste it on big boards which would then go to the printer and they would make films and then and then it would go through the print process. Um, so I think one of the um, one of the early fascinations um, about the work that people did in the '70s and '80s is the amount of physical, the the way the physical labor was different to produce books and journals and magazines and newspapers, and the way technology has revolutionized things. Um, and of course, one of the things that made the presses possible in the 1970s was other forms of technology like mimeograph, right? And like Xerox, there's all of these stories in women's letters um, around the feminist, around feminist publishing of like, well, send, you know, drop this off at my house. And when I go into the office and my boss is at lunch, I'll make 200 copies and then you can fold and cut and like turn them into a chat book or whatever the project was that people were working on. So technology is one of the through lines that we always, that I really see um, in the narrative of the book. Um, and at the same time, it's, dra it's radically transformed, right? I don't do paste up anymore. Now we do everything on computers. Um, but um, in this, in just the past couple of months, we've had this huge um, technology glitch with Sinister Wisdom where our January issue was dropped at the post office on December 29th. And it just arrived to me last Friday and is just getting out to, subs out to subscribers. And um, I say it's a technology glitch in terms of um, because the U.S. Postal Service is the technology we use to distribute the journal. And they had challenges from cuts from the previous administration and COVID and they've had all of these slowdowns. And so the journal has struggled to get out there. And um, it's one of the moments where I really felt like external technology um, the struggles that that women experienced with that um, that I write about in the book and that I've written about in other places, I was experiencing it as well. I blame that on Louis DeJoy. I do too. I, I well, I ultimately blame it on the former president, but <laughs> Louis DeJoy can take lots of blame as well. Um, <laughs> But you know, it's this this ecosystem, right, of how we're interacting with um, these different technologies, these modes of production and distribution. So, digital technology can be described as lesbian print culture, also. Then, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. And what is the future of lesbian print culture? Would you say? Um, I was just reading, there's this great new journal. I think it's the second that they produce it as a PDF. I think I was just reading, if I recall right, their second issue, Lesbians Are Magic um, is the title. I think it's lesbiansaremagic.com. But I think if you Google that, it'll show up. I, um, a poet um, that I know had a poem published in it. And so I read, read about it in her newsletter and went and downloaded it and was thrilled and delighted um, because I think that, you know, it's harder for me to say what the future looks like, um, but I'm always excited to be living in a present where there are lots of different um, independent lesbian journals, lesbian publishing projects where people are interested in thinking about how do we take our words and our ideas and put them out in the world using the tools that are available to us. And I, you know, ultimately I think that's what women were doing in 1969, in 1979, in 1984, all throughout the book. And I think that's what we continue to do. So in that way, I'm always um, excited about what the future holds because I think that Lesbian stories are 
um, so vi they're so vital to us and they're so vital within our communities that we always want to get them out and we want to get them out in the world in our own ways like and with our own sort of set of integrity and so I think that means that we're um, there's always a need for independent lesbian publishing and um, and that we sort of think about that and and reinvent it um, each each generation so that we can um, speak to each other and speak to the future. There's another new lesbian publication coming out of Brooklyn called WMN Zine. You know yes, that? yes, I love it. They are I, fabulous. They're fabulous. It's so beautiful, beautifully printed. Yes, I ordered them all when they came out. We put them in the Sinister Wisdom newsletter. It's they're fantastic. Yes. And we had them on the show. They're energetic and committed and lesbian focused. Excellent. Yep. Tell us about the book. Like, who do you talk about? How is it organized? So um, I, it's organized into um, four sections, right? And I, st I talk first about the, um, you know, the people, the, the, a, first, a first wave, the people in the 1970s who really started, who really said, lesbians have books in them and we should publish them as lesbian publishers, right? And so I look at, um, I spend a lot of time on Women's Press Collective because I love them. Um, and of course, you know, Judy Gron, Pat Parker was a part of them. Um, and, um, and there were archives available. Um, I also write in that chapter about Diana Press, right? Where, um, where Reed Mae Brown's first um, collection of poetry was published. Um, or republished after NYU Press published it. But so Diana Press, which ultimately merges with Women's Press Collective. I also talk about Daughters Inc. and um, June Arnold and Park Bowman. Um, I have to confess, I'm still kind of in love with Park Bowman. Um, never met her, right? But she just is such a huge, wonderful character. Um, so that's, that's uh, sketches out some of the 1970s. Then I go on to the 1980s and I really think about um, if, if the folks in the 1970s had the vision that, that this could be done, um, a lot of people in the 1980s were thinking about how can we do it better, right? So people were aware of what had happened in the past and were working to try and build a better mousetrap. And um, so I look, I do um, a chapter on Persephone Press um, and, in, and think in particular, uh, they're such a great model for thinking about the ways that intersectionality was a part of feminism and a part of lesbianism um, from very early on, which is a narrative that we sometimes lose track of. Um, and they're also a great example of um, they had the vision and the chutzpah to really do things and struggled with the business side of things. Um, and then, and it's really, they become kind of pivotal for thinking about the next generation, um, which are people who have business experience in publishing or who really um, um, understand business in fundamental ways. And that's why I really look at Nancy Barriano's Firebrand Press and Barbara Greer's uh, Naiad books. And both of them, I think, really understood the commercial part of publishing and um, understood that publishing could be commercially viable for lesbians. And they did it in different ways, um, but they're both really interesting. Um, and then, uh, you know, the last part is really thinking about survivors and looking at Aunt Loot and spinsters and how they started in, um, started separately, came together for a while, then broke up, but continue um, publishing legacies um, and thinking about that. And I really think about you know, I do think that um, a lot of scholars have written about 2000, you know, things start to change in the book world in 2000. Um, and I think a lot of times I hear in lesbian and feminist communities, like people feel like feminism falls apart or, um, or somehow we weren't quite good enough to sustain what we had. You know, people feel this about the women's bookstores and women's newspapers and all of this. And one of the arguments I make is, you know, that's absolutely not true. That's, that's bunk. It's not that 
feminism or lesbian feminism was somehow flawed and we couldn't sustain things. It was that there's a broader um, economic system that's happening, that's changing things, that creates challenges within book publishing, within print publishing. And what, what we see happening within the lesbian feminist publishers is, is um, not some ideological failure that they have, nor is it a failure of their business sense. It's a reaction to broader economic trends, which are um, fa uh, falling apart of advertising. Um, a challenge, a uh, 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 neoliberal capitalism where larger becomes better and there's less space in the marketplace for smaller distributors. And there's all of this consolidation that happens. And I think those are the things that ultimately um, bring an end to some of these presses and um, some of them, like Aunt Lute, say, well, we have to think about this a different way and we have to do business a different way given the conditions of capitalism that we're dealing with right now. So lesbian print culture is continuing. Absolutely, absolutely. I think we're trying to figure out how to make um, independent lesbian print culture, independent lesbian writing, art, literature viable in a capitalist system that is devaluing all of our labor and um, intellectual work. Well, that's wonderful. And I'm confident that lesbian print culture will prevail. And you, I am too. Well, I'm really looking forward to the publication of your book. We'll have to have you on again when it comes out. Thank you. Yes. Julie Enzer, thank you for joining us. All right. As people who routinely watch all things LGBTQ, you know that we like to follow legislative action. And currently there is a bill that has been introduced to our legislature, H-128. Representative Taylor Small is one of the co-sponsors. And on passage, this bill would put in place a ban on the use of a trans gay panic defense in a criminal act. As part of the initial testimony, Safe Space from the Pride Center introduced statistics about the incidence of violence against LGBTQ people. And I will tell you that I was taken aback. So we have invited Anne from the Pride Center and Safe Space to talk to us about the program and those statistics. Welcome, Anne. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here today. Oh, I, I'm so glad that you could join us because this is an important issue. And, and as I had mentioned to you, talking about LGBTQ plus violence here in Vermont is not something that anybody else is reporting. So it's been a while since people from Safe Space have been on. So could you tell us just briefly, Safe Space, the programs you offer? Sure, yeah. So the Safe Space Anti-Violence Program is a program that's housed within the Pride Center of Vermont. And we're a statewide program and we serve LGBTQ plus people in Vermont who've experienced harm, violence, and or discrimination. So we really leave that intentionally broad in hopes to kind of capture the full scope of the impacts and the um, experiences that our community kind of go through. So, but kind of more traditional ways we think about that could be someone accessing our services because of sexual violence or domestic violence, or maybe discrimination at their employment. Um, and we, we provide services to folks in a couple different ways. We have a support line. It's not a hotline, it's not 24 seven. We say it's a warm line um, and it's open when the Pride Center is open, which is Monday through Thursday, 10 to six and Friday, 10 to two. And that number is 802-863-0003. And you can also find that on our website pridecentervt.org and then you click safe space. Um, and also on our website is a confidential web chat line. Um, part of, we're gonna kind of go into kind of 
trends that we've seen with increased violence and one way that our program has responded to the fact that now more than before people are living in closer proximity with people who are causing them harm. We wanted to recognize that calling might not be an option for folks. So this is what this kind of confidential chat line has been set up for. So um, there's no way for us to know who's chatting. It's completely anonymous. Um, and it's really easy for you to exit out should you have to quickly leave the website. Um, and then you can also reach us via email, which is safespace at pridecentervt.org. And like I said, our advocacy looks really different. It could just be emotional support. Um, it could be, you know, providing systems advocacy, helping someone navigate the courts or the medical system. Um, and it could also be resource connection. So connecting people to different resources or options that they might need. It, it's really determined by the person. So it really is an individual basis and um, we're there and we're, we're ready and happy to listen. So I hope you reach out if you're listening to this and you need our services. Those are very impressive programs. How did you become involved with the Safe Space program? Yeah, so I, um, I'm not originally from Vermont. I grew up in Michigan, but I had come to Vermont to do my um, undergraduate education. And when I was there, I did an internship with Mike in the GLAM program. <laughs> so I was a GLAM intern. Um, and that's how I first knew about Pride Center. And um, yeah, then I went off and I actually lived in Sweden for several years. And I worked there with, um, in Sweden, you can, as I believe you can hear, but it is a little different, um, apply for asylum on the basis of LG, uh, a gender and or sexual identity discrimination in the home country. So I worked with refugees and asylum seekers in Sweden. And when it was time to come back, my heart was kind of in that LGBTQ plus advocacy work. I had kind of had the the connection and the good experience with Pride Center. And I was just fortunate enough that a job with Safe Space opened up when I was coming back to Vermont. So, and so I've been with Safe Space um, maybe like two and a half years now. You know, looking at what the last four years and the increase in hate groups within the US, mm -hmm. some of what you were providing to the committee was a reflection of how that increase in hate group activity was impacting our communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so the numbers that I had reported to the committee, I looked back to our numbers from 2018 and 2019. Um, and for those of you who are interested, we have to do quarterly reporting to the VOCA Victims of Crime Act. And so that's where I, I pulled these numbers from. But in 2018 and 2019, um, about where the, where's that number? I should have it memorized by now. I've said it so much. 43% um, of all of the, the survivors that we served had experienced some kind of hate violence. And our definition of hate violence um, is not strictly just hate crimes. We also include it um, we also include like persistent discrimination, for example, in that. Um, so any hate-based violence. So 43% of folks on average from 2018 to 2019 had experienced that. And then I looked back from our most recent report, which was the last three months. Um, so I believe that would be October through January of this past year. And it had increased to 55%. Um, and now I want to say that we, how we uh, classify or how we kind of quantify this data is that hate violence is in its own category from domestic and family violence, um, which we've, we've also seen an increase. So in 2018 and 2019, there was an average about 28 and a half percent of people we served were experiencing domestic violence. We include family violence in the definition of domestic violence. Um, and then the past three months, about 40% of people we've served have been impacted by domestic violence. Okay, those numbers just seem staggering to me. I mean, that, that sounds as though, you know, regardless of the work that we have tried to do here in Vermont with acceptance and inclusion, 
that social change hasn't necessarily followed that and that the rise of hate that we were seeing in other parts of the country is very evident here as well. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, absolutely. And I think also part of my testimony, I was saying that um, just really heartbreakingly 2020 is being considered the deadliest year for um, trans and gender nonconforming folks. And while, you know, we haven't seen fatalities rise in Vermont in that regard, like it's definitely, it feels like it's following that trend of increased hate in our state. And and I also understand that the Pride Center itself in, in the last several years has been a target of vandalism and hate-based action. That's correct. Yeah, us and um, yeah, Outright Vermont. And um, it's also Ohavi Zedek in Burlington, I believe, the most recent one. So there's also the anti-Semitic hate along with that as well. So look... There was the piece of legislation that was introduced to put in place a ban on the use of trans and gay panic defenses. Are, are there other things that should be happening now that we as a community should be supporting or be aware of in response to this increase in hate within our state? That's a really, that's a really great and, um, I feel like a nuanced, complex question, right? I feel like we could talk for hours about this. Um, but I think the piece that I kind of want to highlight too, or at least how we're sort of making sense in this rise is um, we're seeing that more often than not, especially in the past three months, that this hate is being perpetrated or this harm is being caused by um, neighbors, landlords, and employers as well as well as intimate partners with the domestic violence. Um, so it it's really it's um it's happening at home. And we think we're seeing this because people are in more constant contact with people who are causing them harm. So you know, as far as that goes, I mean, I think it it really kind of comes down to the 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 day-to-day -day interactions of just saying of knowing that these are happening in these communities that I think, unfortunately, a lot of us now can pinpoint like the, the house on the block or the neighbor who has, you know, anti-LGBTQ plus sediment, sentiments, not sediments, <laughs> um, <laughs> sentiments, um, and saying that like, this is, this is not tolerated in our state. And you know, that's not to say that people haven't been saying that already, right? Um, been saying it for decades and decades, but, but it is interesting that right now that we are seeing that it's really happening kind of neighbor to neighbor within these within our communities more now. And if I heard the statement you made previously correctly, some of this is a direct result of COVID frustration that, you know, I, I have been confined for so long. My tolerance is, is dwindling. So all of those biases that may have been somewhat dormant have sort of risen to the surface. Right, right. And you know, I'm no political analyst, but I can play one on TV now that I'm sure that like the past three months that we looked at was, you know, October to January. I do wonder how much the election um, influenced that rise that we saw. Um, and I also what was the right okay yeah thank you that that's what also the other thought i had about um in regards to covid is that we're also seeing that folks have less options so whereas before maybe we could help get them out of a situation um which you know we still can but there are less options for safe shelters or maybe someone might have the option of like going and staying with their friend or their family member whereas now that might not feel safe um so i think it's also it's escalating more because there's less of a release around that as well so so we need our people in positions of leadership to continue making their statements that hate is not tolerated here and naming it when it happens, which 
I have been really pleased with. Okay, so moving forward, as as COVID has continued, are there any changes that Safe Space is thinking of, of putting into place specifically in response to COVID? That's a, a great question. I mean, I think we put in that that um, anonymous chat line, but I really think that like COVID, like with so many of us, has really made us reconsider the ways in which we're connecting with people and how how we're getting our outreach out there and and what does safety like what is safety for people? Um, and I think it's really interesting too. This is a slight tangent, but. Um, we've been putting on together LGBTQ plus town hall series and I had which are amazing there's one coming up on aging on February 18th um but I led one on housing and we were talking about the impacts of COVID and housing and what does safe housing mean for folks and um a lot of people came back and answered space now since the pandemic like space is something that I would consider to constitute safe housing. So I think right now with the town hall series too, especially is, is collecting of like, what ha what is our community's um, views on, on what is safe and what support looks like for them and how has that changed? And then how can we kind of adapt our services to meet those needs? Now, I wanna circle back a bit because as, as you were talking about safe space, and the responses from our community. I didn't ask you, you know, you had referenced that 2020 was the most lethal year for transgender, particularly women of color. Looking at the people who are approaching the safe space now for services, are we following that trend? That people who identify as transgender may be singled out more than other parts of our community, or is it just unilateral right now? Yeah, I don't have the specific percentages on that, but we are seeing that trans and gender nonconforming people are, are experiencing violence kind of across the board at higher rates than cisgender folks are, unfortunately. Okay, that's yeah, that's kind of what I suspected, but I I needed to clarify it. So yeah, I understand I that I understand in the near future that the Pride Center might be having an announcement to make about the safe space program. Correct? That's correct. Yeah. So, so keep your eye out. <laughs> okay. And and safe space became one of the member programs of the Vermont Network against domestic and sexual violence, correct? That's correct. So you you not only have your own internal resources, you have that network that you can reach out to for support as needed. And it also gives you some access to victim crime services to provide some additional support. So with that, any any closing comments that you would like to give to members of our community as to how we can best support the work of Safe Space? Um, I would say reach out to one another. This is, this is a tough time. Like connect with people, connect with friends, connect with your chosen family. And you know, for the survivors out there, like we're here when you're ready on your time. So just know that that we're here as a resource. And yes, COVID is hard and it is changing the landscape for how we're providing services, um, but we're here to figure it out together. So, yeah. And that, and that you are an LGBTQ plus specific service. So yeah. I don't have to worry about having to translate my experience so that you have an understanding. Absolutely, we say we are uh, we are by queer people for queer people. So <laughs> no worries there. As it should be. And with that, thank you, Anne. And I look forward to your your announcement coming up and inviting you all back. Thanks, Keith. As people who are regular viewers will note. We've been trying to spend some time looking at 
resources, advocacy, how Vermont's LGBTQ plus elders might move forward. And in keeping in that series of interviews, joining me today are two people associated with the Thane Maine organization and Equality Maine and their SAGE project. So the first person I'd like to introduce is John Hennessy. Welcome, John. Thank you, Keith. Nice to be here. Thank you so much for making time. So as I understand, John, you were one of the people who were a co-founder for the Sage Maine when it first started. Could you tell us a little bit about when that happened and what it was that you and the other founders would hope to come out of that same Maine organization? Uh, sure. Uh, uh, by way of background, uh, this, this whole idea started about 11 years ago. Uh, I was working for AARP, AARP Maine, of course, and I was invited to a, a national aging conference hosted by a group called SAGE. I, I'd never heard of it, to be honest with you. Uh, and AARP uh, was a strong partner with SAGE nationally and was encouraging state offices to to, to uh, get familiar and to understand what SAGE was all about. So I was thrilled to go down to New York and meet 400 of my new best friends from all over the country, indeed all over the world, uh, to, to uh, talk about LGBT aging. Uh, I, I, to be, again, Keith, perfectly honest, I, I, I hadn't identified the population as needing something called SAGE until I found out about SAGE and then I was hooked. And coincidentally, Sage was very, very interested in establishing an, aff an affiliate in Maine. Uh, as you know, between um, Maine and Florida, we, we flip back and forth who's the oldest state per capita. And uh, Maine, of course, uh, has always had a high, um, again, per capita. I recognize we're a very small state, uh, but we've always had a, a strong presence of LGBT um, people and particularly couples. Uh, we've ranked either, it, we've always ranked in the, in, in the top 10 in the country, and of course, those people were aging. So again, with the resources of AARP behind came back to Maine and said, how do we establish an organization like this here? And I pulled together a stakeholder group, which at the time was maybe about 18 people across the state, and uh, we convened a uh, AARP was ahead of the curve when it came to technology. We were able to do uh, Zoom-like presentations uh, back in 2010 and 11, so we were very lucky because Maine geographically was 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 a challenge. Uh, but people came together quickly because they they had a they had a sense that uh, the community was in need of something that like Sage could offer, and we found out. Uh, because we put together the, a statewide needs assessment to, to absolutely uh, pull, you know, get, get information from our, from our community all over the state about what they were looking for as they age. And, and as, as you and I were talking earlier, it was about staying at home as they age, staying at home safely as they age. Well, we worked with the University of New England to put together the most comprehensive a um, statewide needs assessment that SAGE had ever seen before. Um, so much so that they held it up as an example for other states and other SAGE affiliates as an example of how to do something really well. I was very, very proud of that report. Um, it, it, and you might uh, find this interesting that SAGE at that time pushed back on us, Keith, because they said, uh, they'd never had a statewide affiliate before. They wanted us to consider being Sage Southern Maine or Sage Greater Portland, if you will. And the people around that table said, absolutely not. It's Sage Maine or nothing. And, and I, I uh, honored that decision then. I honor that decision today. But I don't know that we realized how big a challenge that was because of the size of our state geographically. So what I'm hearing from you is that the effective strategy is first ensuring that everybody's at the table with a voice. 
you know, Vermont, the same as Maine, there is challenged by rural locations. I also heard you saying partnering with someone that has a degree of expertise and really getting information about what the needs are. I also heard you referencing AARP a great deal. Were they a good partner in this project? It wouldn't have happened without AARP. It, it really didn't. The, uh, like I mentioned, the, the, at the national level, SAGE has been affiliated with AARP probably going on 30 years now. SAGE started as a New York-based organization and AARP going back into the, um, well, maybe not 30, let's go say early 90s, uh, uh, AARP recognized that the LGBT population was an underserved uh, community in their in their vast portfolio. Remember, AARP at any given date has about 40 million members across the country. Uh, so that when when uh, when the AARP wants to help you do something, you're going to say yes. Uh, so my, my my advice to the folks in Vermont would be to reach out to AARP Vermont uh, right away. Uh, to see what kind of um, uh, resources they might offer to help uh, identify the population, do a needs assessment, et cetera, et cetera. So John, when you went to that first meeting and you met the people from SAGE, you said you were impressed by what they had to offer and realized, oh my, we need this. What was it that they were offering that got your attention? Well, of course, it was based in New York. He's, so they had, uh, and, and I'm a native New Yorker, uh, so I'm a little bit proud. Uh, they have everything. At the Sage, the Sage chapter in New York has all kinds of services that they offer to to um, to the community, uh, whether it's um, case management services, whether it's uh, congregate meal settings, whether it's any kind of counseling therapies that you that you'd be interested. They had social programs, exercise programs. The, Whatever you would want to, to uh, as an aging person, they had it. Uh, their, their facility was open, I believe, from eight o'clock in the morning till eight o'clock at night, six days a week, and then uh, shorter hours on Sunday. And, it, and, and you, when you walked into their, to their facility, you could just feel the energy, you could feel the pride, you could feel the joy that uh, people had being uh, together as in, in, you know, in this community, because as, as, as we age, and it's not unique to the LGBT population, but as we age um, in this society, in America particularly, uh, we become invisible uh, and irrelevant in some places. Uh, but SAGE was not about to let that happen. In fact, for the longest time, and maybe it still is, uh, their tagline was, we refuse to be invisible. That, that spoke to me as an, a person in the community who was aging, and I thought, this was really something I wanted to be to be affiliated with. That that's an incredibly good motto. So I understand, though, that Sage Maine merged or became a part of Equality Maine. Could you tell us a little bit about what was behind bringing those two organizations together? Sure. For the first um, five, almost six years, Sage Maine was a volunteer-run organization. And, and doing fairly well, uh, establishing networks all across the state. But we, we, um, we came to the realization back in probably the early part of 2019, because I went to a SAGE affiliate meeting in, Port, in the other Portland, in Portland, Oregon, and I listened to what other SAGE affiliates were able to do that had um, full-time staff, uh, that had an affiliate with, with another organization like their Equality Federation organization. And I came back and I said, this is what we have to do. Uh, and I worked with the, the then board of it of, and, and convinced them that we had to consider for the sustainability of the organization and for the growth of the organization uh, to consider a merger with our partners at Equality Maine. Uh, that was met with um, immediate interest from the folks at Equality Maine. Of course, with, uh, you know, the, the, our, our period of due diligence was, was, was extensive and ultimately the merger uh, came together and we couldn't be any happier. And as I understand it, you're on an advisory committee for Equality Maine specifically 
in relationship to the SAGE project? Well, I was invited to join the board of Equality Maine as, as a, some kind of, uh, I, hate, I hesitate to use these words, but institutional memory uh, so that the SAGE uh, uh, program didn't, you know, just didn't flounder. Uh, and, and of course, then they asked me to be the liaison to the SAGE program, and, and I said yes. Okay. As we become elders, that you know, historical memory component is something we contend with a great deal. So that leads us very well introducing Alyssa Miller. Hi, Alyssa. Hello. And as I understand it, you're an AmeriCorps VISTA person who is currently working with Equality Maine, and you are the program assistant for the yes. SAGE project. Yes, I am very excited to be spending my year of service at Equality Maine. I saw the listing for this position and immediately knew it was something I was interested in doing. Um, and so essentially my my day to day work has been coordinating SAGE programming and SAGE services over the past six months, which has definitely looked very different than it might look in normal everyday circumstances as we contend with the challenges that coronavirus brings to the situation. That's indeed very true as, as our organizations in Vermont are also experiencing. So if, if I'm an LGBTQ elder in Maine and I approach the same project, what is it that I could expect that you're gonna offer to me? At the moment, a lot of our programming is focused on reducing isolation for folks who have been essentially in their homes now for a year with very limited capacity to meet other people in person. So we've been offering a lot of social programming via the platform Zoom. Um, so we have a monthly speaker series where we bring in speakers to talk about relevant topics to the community. So we had someone talk about mental health, especially through the holiday season this year. We also had someone talk about um, the COVID-19 vaccine and what to expect because this was before it, it had started to reach members in our community. Um, we also have just some more lighthearted social situations. So we have a bi-weekly happy hour that happens twice a month that has been very fun and relaxed. It's just a way to connect with the community. And we also have a monthly cooking class where members will come teach a recipe that they know and people can follow along. So that's been really fun. I've learned recipes from those programs. Um, but that's been a primary focus for the past couple of months is really trying to fill these months that have looked so different for so many people with ways to still have meaningful connections. Um, especially during the holiday season, that was a big focus. Um, we hosted an online Thanksgiving, which was really, really nice to help kind of mark the holiday for folks who probably were not able to gather either with extended family or with chosen family. Um, and I really was glad to be part of that experience. So when, when COVID eventually, uh -huh. or as we get used to COVID and you know, we sort of move into the next phase, are, is there additional programming that the SAGE project is looking at developing or resuming again? Yeah, so before COVID, um, there would be monthly dinners and these were a really big staple point of the organization in which the meals were offered at a very low cost to make them more accessible for folks. Um, and they were also it's a gathering place monthly for, for lots of folks to get together. And I think that was a really important cornerstone of the community. Speakers could also come in. Um, it could be, a, it was used as kind of a, an announcement forum to get information out there. And so once we are able to gather in person, that is definitely a goal for us to be able to host again. There are other things we're definitely interested in on the horizon, um, Sage, Maine has held a biannual aging symposium um, that was a, a great way for folks to gather, to get information, to, to share resources, learn from experts, and, and talk about aging issues within the community. And so while we are holding a version of that online in April, it's not the same as hosting it in person, and we'd like to be able to do one in person when, when, when things are open again. 
it sounds like all of these activities are sort of have the vision of creating community. And knowing that Made in Vermont share that rural quality that you know we have you know, some strong metropolitan areas, but then some people may live 10 miles away from their nearest neighbor. What, what is it that SAGE has done in Maine to try and respond to that rural quality? I think one of the benefits of it being a statewide organization has meant that there have been some regional groups that have developed within Sage Maine um, to make it so gatherings can be closer to people's houses. So there, there was a gathering in Portland, there was a gathering in Augusta, there was an, a, a gathering in Bangor. And so that kind of helped to reach more, more people across the state. One thing I have found really interesting as a benefit of of the Zoom time is that we can host statewide events on Zoom and people don't have to travel. Um, so that has actually allowed us to reach some folks that we might not have been able to um, normally, um, especially if they live in a more rural area. We've also begun to implement, um, we had a phone call program run for three months this year um, to help reach folks who might not necessarily feel comfortable on Zoom or or, or feel super comfortable with technology, but might have a phone. And so that was really nice to run as well and try and reach more people in our community. So talking about that sort of outreach and different areas, has SAGE done anything to try and help elders learn technology? I have referred several people to the National Dig, uh, Digital Equity Center, which is actually based in Maine, um, and, and trying to help get people connected with that organization. Uh, we've also done some referrals to like the area agencies on aging, um, sometimes have courses and things like that. We, in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, wrote up some written instructions and also made some video examples of how to connect to Zoom and how to use Zoom and, and put those on our main page on the website as well. Okay, I, I was going to say Zoom has become almost the necessary skill to survive COVID. Okay, so with that, I want to thank both of you for sharing this time with you and ask if each of you could just, in closing, if there was one thing that we should focus on here in Vermont as we look at reaching out to LGBTQ plus elders what would that be? And, and John, you can go first. I, I would just follow up. My enthusiastic endorsement would be for you to reach out to the area agencies on aging in Vermont. I don't know how many there, there might be, uh, but they were fast partners with us. Uh, and they made so many things possible. The Congregate Meal Program, for example, because of their federal funding, we were able to tap into the Meals on Wheels budget to, to make this happen. So. The Area Agencies on Aging, they are the experts. Uh, they will help you. Uh, th th I believe it's in their charter to, to, to uh, work with underserved populations. And with the new federal administration in place, they will be a wealth of resource for, for you and for the community, uh, I guarantee. And Alyssa? I think the biggest thing I've really taken away um, from being here, and, and John kind of referenced it when talking about the founding of SAGE, is just getting as many voices and perspectives at the table as you can. It's really a collaborative effort. So when we've been planning these big events, I've personally been really assisted by having so many community members um, help give feedback, help talk about what the, the needs and the wants are. Um, and it's really a group effort. It's about creating community both within the people volunteering and, and serving the organization and then expanding that out to community members. Okay, and so with that, thank you. And I look forward to us getting back together in a year <laughs> and sharing these are the things we've done. So thank you. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you in two weeks, but in the meantime, Resist. Resist.